Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name is Toby and today I'm very happy to welcome and introduce three guests. Peter Duisenberg is the president of the Association of Universities in the Netherlands. He was previously a member of the Dutch Parliament for the Liberal VVD Party, that's the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy in English. His academic background is in economics. Meanwhile, Joost Sneller is also a Liberal MP, in his case for the D66 party, for which he is the spokesperson on financial affairs and the media. And finally, Lisbeth Hulst is a researcher. She was trained as both a lawyer and a psychologist, and she now investigates the law and behaviour at Utrecht University. Uh, Her work focuses on bringing behavioural science perspectives to bear on making the law more effective. And it's that very topic, how the law can be made more effective using science and evidence, that we want to discuss today. And in particular, um, some recent and some might say quite radical experiments going on in that direction in the Parliament of the Netherlands. So welcome to the podcast, Peter, Joost and Lisbeth. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Welcome all three of you. So as I mentioned, the main topic I want to talk about is uh, a rather exciting new scheme in the Dutch Parliament. But at the risk of burying the lead, let's do this the academic way around and start with some some kind of basic background. Um, so maybe, Peter, perhaps I could start by asking you to lay out for us how the Dutch Parliament in general tries to bring scientific evidence into its policy making. Yeah, so uh, sort of a general uh, movement in Dutch Parliament to, to get evidence to play a bigger role in Parliament. As you mentioned in the introduction, I was uh, also a member of Parliament myself uh, in the past, and so I've been part of that movement. And so in the past, I've basically, there there were sort of two big streams of activities. Uh, One is generally to have more focus on the budgets and accounts and and, and to be a bit more professional and and have more controls uh, around that. So there's a number of initiatives around that 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 I've been involved in, but also that Joost, who is also, of course, in this conversation, is now involved in. And the other big activity category is everything where science and Parliament tried to get together uh, better, uh, which is uh, fact sheets, breakfast uh, to uh, to get knowledge into the political debate. And maybe just maybe just to add, uh, in the latter category, uh, we are, for example, solicit briefing papers from scientists on specific topics, uh, or we have uh, hearings that we organize where also uh, professors, for example, or scientists uh, come to. Uh, uh, as witnesses to offer their uh, opinions. Uh, and Peter is absolutely right that there is sort of this movement within uh, Parliament and within uh, the, the broader public. But of course, it also goes against the, the general trend of more fact-free politics happening at the same time, maybe in a different uh, part of the political spectrum, but still happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that's an interesting point. Maybe we could just dwell on that for a moment. As you say, there is an apparent trend away from a reliance on evidence, at least in the way some political arguments are presented in public. Do you think this is true also in the Netherlands or do you book that trend? Yeah, that's difficult to say. It's, it, I think it is sort of a double movement. I think our general movement uh, in the Netherlands is that, and especially actually the, the last year, of course, uh, with uh, Corona, uh, there's, there's a whole new view on, on science, but, but also before Corona, there, actually there is a movement towards using science better, want to have more evidence in the political uh, debate. Uh, now, how to put it into practice is, is a different thing, because the, in the heat of politics, it might be difficult to apply the facts. And also, of course, there are always political parties who are a bit more fact-free than others, also in the Netherlands. Okay, well, before we dive too deeply into waters, which we may not uh, we may not be equipped to navigate right now, let's talk instead about what we intended to talk about, which is the new Dutch parliamentary scheme that I alluded to, that we both alluded to. Could you tell us about what's happening now in the Dutch parliament in that respect? Uh, since uh, the 1st of January 2018, there's a new uh, Accountability Act, uh, new Article 3.1, Uh, which stipulates that uh, every proposal from the Dutch government uh, should contain a statement of the the goals, the efficacy and the efficiency. 
and also what kind of uh, policy instruments uh, they want to use and what kind of uh, financial consequences they will have for the for the government, the central government, uh, but also for uh, other societal actors. But of course, this kind of law doesn't have any uh, sanction over and beyond what parliament does uh, to use it. Because if parliament still passes the law that is being proposed by government without uh, checking if those uh, criteria are fulfilled, government will have no incentive to actually adhere to the law. So what we've been trying to do since uh, the 1st of January 2018 is give it some more buddy and some more bite uh, within parliament to actually challenge the government on whether uh, it's really gone to the utmost to uh, detail those goals as well and uh, argue uh, why a, a certain policy instrument would be the most uh, effective. Um, and as part of that uh, general trend, we wrote a report, uh, my colleague from the, the Dutch Greens, Bart Snells and I, uh, on uh, the question, did the parliament actually ask appropriate questions uh, during the debates on the uh, legislative proposals uh, where the government was supposed to uh, argue on the, the uh, 3.1 criteria. Uh, and in the first report, which covered the first year uh, of the law, uh, we found that it was pretty meager. Um, and then uh, fast forward to the current pilot, uh, Peter Duisenberg, who was uh, actually in parliament when this uh, law was passed. And the two of us uh, thought it would be a good idea to have also scientists uh, challenge whether the government actually had a, st a sort of state-of-the-art approach towards making these kind of uh, goals uh, smart and whether their theory of change of uh, arguing why uh, a specific policy instrument was chosen is actually the most logical between parentheses. Um, so this pilot uh, gives uh, us as parliamentarians a sort of second opinion from uh, scientists on whether uh, government has done its uh, job properly. Yeah, and this is one part that I found particularly interesting because, of course, in a way, there's nothing new or radical about saying um, when we're making laws, well, let's try to make sure that the, the measures we put in place will actually work. And I know, Lisbeth, that's, that's your kind of specialist subject, right? Making sure that legal measures are effective in terms of actually changing people's behaviours and in, obviously in the intended way. So that's all well and good. And I guess it's interesting that that's enshrined in law in the Netherlands. But what's really interesting to me here is that the parliament has then subsequently decided that it won't just make itself the judge of that, but it'll bring in scientific experts ahead of time to assess and, and challenge efficacy. Lisbeth, that's been your role in one of these projects, I understand, to act as an internal, sorry, an external expert. I was just one of the experts. There were three teams and um, with three three different bills, um, and I was just working on one of these bills relating to uh, radicalization. Yeah. Okay. So, could you outline what your role was in that project? What were you asked to do as experts? Yeah. So, so what we had to answer was um, the extent to which these questions from the Accountability Act are included in the bill, and whether the choices um, uh, that had been made by the minister that presented this bill uh, were logical and um, what would be the best choices given the state of the evidence um, in science. So that's a rather different question than the standard science for policy question. Uh, you know, a certain question, what is the evidence? Here we were asked to look at the bill and, you know, um, suggest improvements in light of the ev evidence in science. Okay, so I guess you're more like peer reviewers than researchers. So the input comes as like a quality check during the legislative process. So, and that then that, I have a question for, for Joust or Peter. How do you decide which experts to involve in reviewing each bill? How do you choose them? Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me try to answer that. So, so when a new bill comes along, enters into the parliament and into the parliamentary process, then basically the committee that uh, deals with that bill, that could be the Committee for Education or the Committee for Energy and, uh, and Economic Affairs uh, or the Committee for, uh, for Legal Affairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that committee decides, the parliamentarians decide whether they want to do an, uh, a 3.1 check. 
and we've we've designed certain criteria for that, which has to do with the impact, with the amounts involved, uh, maybe political relevance. So a number of criteria uh, to decide for the committee whether they want to have a 3.1 check. If they do, then they ask our uh, yeah, central liaison for scientists, which could be a candidate to do that. They, they get more or less four weeks for this process, so the legal process is not delayed too much. And uh, the scientists we select from our database, uh, we know all the scientists in the, in, in the Netherlands. And what, uh, what we try to do is to find scientists which have, well, maybe not exactly the same view. So if, if, the, if it is a field where you might have different views on, uh, on topics, which is uh, quite likely, uh, even from a scientific point of view, then it is good to have sort of a diversity of, uh, of views. And so we're, yeah, that, so we're trying to compose a team of two scientists. And then it's also in the parliamentary committee, there are two parliamentarians which are asked to be the contact person uh, between the two scientists and the rest of the parliamentary committee. And the two politicians should be one from the coalition, the ruling government parties, and one from the opposition party. So you, so it, it sort of gets this neutrality, and because this is really something you do on behalf of the whole committee, it's it's not something which you do for uh, the coalition or specifically for the for the opposition or for a specific political party. You try to get more evidence into the debate, uh, which is to the benefit of the of the entire parliament and the entire committee. So two parliamentarians, two scientists, and then they, the scientists basically go off to work, you could say, <laughs> and they do their work uh, using a checklist, which we uh, developed in this process with the three team pilots, which is more specific on the types of questions that you want to check this article 3.1 requirements on. And the result then is, is what? A, a, like a written report with an assessment of each point on the checklist? Yeah, exactly. It's a written report. It's basically quite concise. Um, so it has seven questions on the checklist, and we've divided it into yeah, two columns, which which uh, which will be in the report. So the columns are, or the first column is is basically, let's say, to establish the basics, uh, which is purely about is the information there. So for example. Uh, Joost talked about uh, information about the specificity of the goals of, of a law. Now, is the information there? Eh? You, can, you can establish whether the information is there, yes or no. Is there an explanation about the policy instruments and why uh, they have been chosen? You can establish that by saying, yeah, yes or no, or this is the type of rationale that we've observed within the documents. Um, now, the other column is where the true scientific uh, insights come, because the other column is what do the latest scientific insights tell us about uh, what the goals could be, or what are the latest scientific insights about the instruments that are most effective, or that are maybe more effective than the ones chosen. So especially the right-hand side is where, it's, uh, where you get the scientific stre stretch in, in, the, in the thinking. Right. And so it, uh, your question was, is it a report? Yes, it is a report. And, and so it is an, uh, it's, it's, it's two columns. And then there are seven questions which, which start with what is the intention of the law? Uh, it then goes to what are the instruments? Uh, what are the more smart objectives? We're making a link to the broader welfare principles. So not, not only economic, but also the broader welfare is also a sort of quite a, a new thing uh, in terms of uh, thinking. Uh, and we're quite elaborate on the evaluation principles because we think the scientists can also help politics to, in advance of the law, think about, okay, when we're going to evaluate, how will we evaluate it over the next years? Yeah, so it's really a broad ranging thing. You don't limit your questions for experts to simply, um, you know, the, the very traditional like natural science domains. Well, maybe a specific uh, example from uh, that happened just today, uh, where the Committee for Agriculture in the Netherlands decided to have a 3.1 check on the proposal from the government uh, on how to go about uh, buying up cattle to reduce uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, which is a big problem in the Netherlands uh, because of our intensive uh, cattle raising and pigs farming. And then uh, scientists will be asked to... Uh, provide their expertise on uh, the government's proposal of how to go about this uh, in the neighborhood of um, nature, natural uh, uh, habitats. 
Ja, ja, but so this is uh, so this is a good next uh, next round. Eh? So we started off with the three teams. So so this uh, we did this project with three teams and also a sort of an overarching team. Uh, the three teams were on the legal affairs. There was a team for education, for an education law, and there was a team for a uh, law on the energy transition. So we had experts from each field. And with these teams and, and the overarching team, which had a number of, uh, let's say, yeah, more methodological uh, experts in it, we developed this uh, yeah, scorecard, eh? this, 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 uh, this template sheet, and also the process. We also said that this, this should be the process, how it enters into the parliament and how you select uh, the scientists and uh, the parliamentarians, etc. And, uh, and, and now it is waiting. We're waiting to see whether the committees are picking it up and, and, and are really going to use it. And this basically what Joost is announcing, that this is going to be the next round. And of course, what we hope is that, it's, that it will be to the benefit of our parliamentary process, or that parliament will use it uh, structurally if it is to their benefit. Uh, what I think helps is that it's a table format in which the scientists present their findings, which... Of course, one of the tricks that the government has is to overwhelm the parliament with paper, uh, whereas this is really uh, putting them on the spot because it just says in, in a sort of very clear, simple table format, uh, is it what's in there and uh, what would be the, uh, the, the critique. So sort of executive uh, summary, so to speak, which makes it also actionable for parliamentarians and in their uh, oftentimes busy lives, I think that would be that will be a big help. Yeah, that's very good. So, but of course, politicians are not the only uh, constituency that is that tend to rely on large amounts of text, uh, because of course you may also find that in the scientific world, right? And this, so I, I want to bring in Lisbeth again because. I'm interested to know kind of what it's like to be a scientist involved in this process. So things like, um, do you feel like you have the time and the genuine kind of freedom and mandate to comment? Um, do you feel like your comments are being taken seriously? And also, how do you handle that issue of communicating in a basically quite a concise table format, what might be a complex set of evidence? What does it feel like from the inside? You know, I have a legal background, but coming from another background, like the other experts. Um, I think it was more difficult for them to dive into the parliamentary documents rather than being presented with a clear question. So it's, it's a really different process. But yeah, for me, it's just, it's very interesting to, um, to combine this process of lawmaking, these, this, this normative legal way of thinking and looking at things with you know, what is out there in terms of evidence and, um, and, and how can you, uh, given the goals that the minister has with this, um, with this proposal, how can you make it more effective or um, is this even effective? Um, so link these worlds. I think that's very interesting and important. Yeah, I mean, that's very much a challenge in the science for policy field in general, I think, the, the challenge to bridge those two worlds, as it were. Um, but, but then, of course, I suppose that's a particularly acute challenge in this case, as you say, because here we are not talking about classical scientific input when, when proposals are being formulated. So right at the beginning of the process, as you might expect for science advisors, this is different because it's bringing in the experts right in the middle of the legislative process when proposals are literally in the most highly politicized stage of the process. They're being debated by the elected representatives themselves. So it's no surprise, I guess, that it's hard for people who aren't familiar with that world to navigate it, even just through documents. Like I can imagine there are many other challenges too, and potential pitfalls, um, when you want to add scientific evidence in at that particular part of the process. But uh, so the involvement in the beginning of the process is also is still there. It's also what Joe's mentioned before, eh? the, the roundtables and the hearings. And I talked about uh, what we call knowledge breakfast, where scientists and politicians come together and uh, uh, the fact sheets, for example. So there are various instruments. And I think it's very interesting to keep on uh, and very important to keep on developing these, these instruments and, uh, and also to do that, uh, for example, with other countries. Uh, and also with the European Union, uh, because there are many best practices out there. And, and so we can learn a lot from each other. That's a whole field which I personally find very interesting uh, to develop that. 
Yeah, but, but this, uh, this law, the law was not accepted for no reason. Uh, it, was, it was accepted basically because what parliament found was that political proposals were, were not properly underpinned by, by evidence, were not properly underpinned by clear targets. Uh, you, you can imagine how a political process goes and then a uh, ministry writes uh, all kinds of great sentences and a lot of paper, as Joost mentioned, about why the law is, is necessary. But is it sharp? And is, it, is, is there evidence for what's being stated? And so that's why the law was passed, to, to be more specific on what are the goals, what instruments, why have you chosen it, uh, what are the consequences, and make it specific. And uh, and basically, it, this was the flow of thinking. And in that thinking, the idea popped up to say, well, why not ask scientists? Because then we don't just get an idea uh, or, let's say, a verdict whether the law is is written according to the principles of this of this Article 3.1, but you also uh, sort of, let's say, as a, as a win-win or as a double win, you also get the latest scientific insights. So that's where it came from. So it's it's the beginning of the process. During the process, all those instruments still still matter, and 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 we're still working on them. But but this is a very specific one in the lawmaking process. And it's it's building a bridge between the two worlds. And I quite like the metaphor that Lisbeth uses for it because it asks scientists from different fields to sort of come closer towards the political process and also towards the legislative process and how laws are written. Uh, but it also asks from politicians to walk towards the scientific side uh, and sort of get to know how scientists think and what kind of interesting uh, facts or studies are out there that we uh, may be sometimes uh, not know about or willingly ignore, uh, but now have to engage with, even if they're uncomfortable for your sort of political position that you wanted to have before. Yeah, and, 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 and crossing the bridge from two sides is, is really a hard job, uh, Toby. It was, uh, as I experienced it, not actually from two sides, because I experienced it in the past as well as a politician. Uh, but, but now in this project, of course, I worked a lot with the scientists. And so the scientists, uh, they would come up with evidence and with papers to, uh, to, to shape their opinion. And I, in the project, I sort of uh, played with one other person. We, we sort of played the political side. And we say, okay, so but what's the so what of, of this? Huh? It's, it's it's a nice nice new paper, but but what can I do with it? Because uh, politicians, of course, they they want evidence, but they also want actionable recommendations. That's that's very in their limited time frame that they have, they need to have something that they can do something with, that they can uh, be be f uh, in favor or against a law, or that they can ask a question about uh, about about something, or that they can make an amendment to the law. So, so what can I actually do with it? Uh, so that's where we tried to push the result towards with the, the table and also the, the type of words that we, that we used in the table. But it's also, of course, where it gets scary uh, territory for scientists because you want it to be evidence-based and being opinioned, opinioned about something and being political about something is something that you sort of yeah try to get away with. You have your independence to to protect, to take care of. That's at the heart of what you do. So um, th that that made it exciting. Basically, that was a challenge. Well, it's I think it's up to the scientists' um, responsibility to distinguish between describing evidence, refraining from providing value-laden policy preferences and also explicitly state when, when the science is incomplete, when science, scientists are asked to make an informed guess by weighing future uncertainties. Yeah, this really interests me, the idea of a scientist being asked to uh, play a different role from normal, because when you cross the bridge, you can end up in a, in a landscape that you might not be naturally equipped for with what you've learned on your side of the bridge, as it were, stretching the analogy a bit here. So, for instance, I'm thinking about issues like where you have disagreements between scientists or unresolved questions in our scientific understanding. Now, scientists know how to work with those and kind of resolve them over time in a scientific way. But when disagreements are brought over the bridge to the policy side, well, um, so different possible answers have different implications for policy, especially when where you land when you step off the bridge is not in a conversation with one policymaker, as it were, so like a specific government official, 
but rather potentially, in this case, in the middle of the cut and thrust of parliamentary debate? Mm. Well, I think the, the different roles remain. Scientists can describe the evidence and they can um, look at the aim of the uh, policymakers, the politicians, uh, the ministry, and they can advise on whether this can be effective, how this could be more effective, but ultimately the decisions um, remain with the democratically chosen uh, politicians. Experts add just one element of the puzzle, um, and especially given that scientists um, tend to bring in evidence from one uh, disciplinary angle only. Whereas the policymakers have to weigh all of the interests and dimensions involved. Now, so for example, if you and uh, Quirin uh, would have different opinions or different theories, and, and you would disagree, eh? so, so suppose that happens. In my view, uh, the the form, the, so what you write down, you should basically write down uh, the different views. So the scientists don't have to come to one consensus view. They can basically say, well, there's this, this school of thought and there's this school of thought. And here are the papers supporting this and here are the papers supporting that. So then they're not, not that conclusive uh, if, if, they, if they disagree, but that, that's fine. Actually, that's, be- that's even better, I would say. Um, yeah. So you have to distinguish between the evidence versus um, experts making an educated guess. Uh, given all, all kinds of uncertainties, you have to distinguish these things. And um, you can just outline yeah, the difference. Um, when, when, when evidence is incomplete, as it all, often is, yeah, you, you just present that. Yeah, I guess you're also being asked uh, quite a constrained question anyway, as defined by the checklist. So you're not being asked, how do we reduce extremism or how do we reduce nitrogen emissions or whatever. You're being asked... Um, here's a set of measures we propose to take. What does the evidence say about whether they will work? So maybe the design of the tool itself helps you stay within your defined role. Yes, and you, and you know the, um, all the other measures in counterterrorism. So you ask about you know, how this is outlined in the law you know, in, in terms of this instrument being effective, those kind of questions, yeah. But, but the scientists can also help the government be more specific in defining what kind of terrorism they want to reduce, uh, what kind of measures of terrorism do they want to use, uh, and how are they, you know, the, to make also informed by their research, uh, make force the government or challenge the government to be more specific in stating its own aims. It doesn't have to say terrorism is not, uh, fighting terrorism is not uh, important or you should fight this particular uh, strand of terrorism but it can given it the government's own stated aims help them be more concrete yes here we were asked um, about this bill that um, tries to um, prescribe um, extremist organizations um, extremist legal entities corporations i have to say and our team advised that, you know, in this bill, it's not clear enough what kind of organizations, what kind of activities um, the government is looking at. So, um, and, and did some suggestions on how to make this more clear and, and then to make it more legally effective. Because when this comes in a court, the court, uh, the court has to decide on this, uh, on this instrument, on actually prescribing um, corporations. Um, it has to weigh the, the public uh, interests of, of fighting uh, terrorism with individual interests of uh, freedom of uh, association. Um, so it has to be very clear uh, what parliament, what, what the government wants to prohibit here. Yeah, that's so, so, so it occurs to me this is a whole different kind of science advice that can come usefully from scientists. So conceptual clarity, because scientists are used to making sometimes very uh, subtle but very important conceptual distinctions in the areas that they study. All right, so so let's look at things from the other side of the bridge then, from the political side. Tell me if this sounds too cynical, um, but having worked in politics for a while, I, I don't think it is. So these proposals, these draft laws, will always have their origin in a political decision or a political objective um, or something like that, whether it's decided by the government that's proposing them or 
uh, enshrined in a party manifesto or a or coalition agreement in the case of the Netherlands. In which case, how can this process, which comes quite late down the track, really expect to change things? Like, are politicians not by this point already invested in their pro- proposal so that they're going to s- struggle to take a step back and say, oh, OK, it turns out our grand idea that we signed up to, or that we were elected on maybe, um, is really not going to work. Let's take a step back and try something else. Does that happen? Can that happen? I'll take this bullet. Um, no, there, I mean, of course, it, it, it takes uh, some flexibility. Um, first of all, I think it does happen quite often that the coalition agreement has been renegotiated. Uh, it, this happened, of course, during uh, Corona times when uh, circumstances changed but also before when uh, things just ended up not working out or being practicable or whether there was uh, problems with the implementation in the executive branch of actually ICT problems uh, preventing a certain instrument from uh, being operationalized. Um, So it does happen. And I think scientific advice can be one of the cues that we should rethink. Uh, Additionally, I think... Uh, the feedback loop should be taken into account here. That when, uh, for example, a coalition agreement is too specific, not in its aims, but in its instruments, uh, we have seen in the past, and there's actually a couple of parliamentary inquiries happening at the moment, what kind of, uh, well, nasty consequences can occur. So I also hope that this pilot will help the general movement towards making broader framed uh, coalition agreements that are not as detailed, not like uh, 100 plus pages of uh, distrust between coalition parties um, being enshrined for the next four or five years, but rather uh, finding each other in a couple of shared aims. And of course, there can be uh, symbols for political parties that are important. And sometimes those are also comprised of the instrument, choice of instruments. Uh, But generally, I think this uh, can help uh, politicians to also look in the mirror of what happens when you are too entrenched in your own uh, choice of instruments without really being able to argue for it, even when, especially when challenged by scientists of what state of the art uh, science would say uh, is a better approach. Indeed, I I think, first of all, uh, I think it's better to turn around halfway than than continue and uh, and make real trouble later on. eh? So once the law is there, of course, you already had a long process of lawmaking and politics and everybody in the trenches, uh, exactly what Joost says. But then at least what what this step adds is that you truly have a good evidence-based debate uh, within the parliament. And so the responsible minister... Uh, truly has to defend it on the right grounds. And if he or she is effective and has it fact-based, then that should be the basis for a law to pass. And if science basically says, well, no, but it's not effective here and there, then still in the lawmaking process, although it is at the end of the, it's one of the later steps, I agree, Toby, uh, then 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 you can basically, you can vote against the law or you can still amend it in certain places. Eh? Also, the things that Lisbeth suggested uh, could be fixed with amendments. Also, the things that, uh, for example, the education team suggested uh, were things that could be fixed with amendments uh, to the law. And, and, and the other effect that helps, that might be an indirect effect, is what Joost explained, is that this will, this might actually push the involvement of evidence and science up in the process, so earlier in the process, because you, you want to think about it beforehand, before you do all the other steps, and not want to find out later on in the process when you once you're in parliament. No, you want to do that in the beginning and say, what do we want to achieve? And maybe not indeed have 180 pages of specific instruments based on the, the, the personal beliefs of people. But I think it will push it. It will push the role of science also up in the process in, in terms of forward in the process earlier. Yeah, besides the upstream effect, so to speak. Uh, there's a, still a lot of laws that don't have their basis in a coalition agreement, huh? but come out of topics that are trends that all of a sudden come up or ev- other events or are just outside the scope of the coalition agreement altogether. And there uh, you can even vote against certain uh, legislative proposals from the government being a coalition party. And this also happens. 
Yeah, Lisbeth, did you want to come in there? No, I, w- I was just wondering um, whether um, you could ask or whether it's already been asked um, uh, to, to the ministry uh, or the minister at hand to pay more attention to this scheme when developing the draft law, so before it gets to parliament. Now that's that's what uh, what will happen. Actually, it's 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 already happening now. So what we see is that actually after Joost and his colleague Bart Snell started to scrutinize the application of Article Three Point One, what you see now is that laws are currently and and uh, and policy papers are being submitted, which have a separate uh, table already in it addressing the different categories of the questions. So so. So you can now still, I've, I've read some of those and you can, I think there's still a lot to be improved, but this is uh, also in terms of the scientific evidence to be added. But, but you see the movements, you see that the ministry in their laws is already taking it into account, basically because the parliamentarians, the two parliamentarians, Joost and Robert Snells, because they started to look at it. And so this is what will happen. Yeah, and just to second what Lisbeth says, of course, when we take it at face value, when they submit a table like that, uh, they will be tending towards more sloppy work, so to speak. <laughs> Whereas if we have uh, professors checking their work, of course, it also provides a stick for them to put in a greater effort. <laughs> I see what you mean. Well, okay, so so let me ask about another concern which kind of comes from the opposite direction if you like but perhaps also reflects some scientists uh, concerns about taking part in this kind of environment because parliament is obviously a very political environment do you think there's a risk that the scheme or the evidence that is put forward under it could kind of weaponize science advice so with experts verdicts um, being used for political point scoring by whoever has an agenda that coincides with it and if so could that lead to the scheme being undermined if people end up being reluctant to take part in it? Are you afraid for the, the scientists or are you afraid for politics? <laughs> well, okay, I mean, you tell me, but my thought was that a scientist might be reluctant to get stuck in at this level if they saw their contributions being picked up and, and wielded in political battles. I feel like conventional science advice at the framing and drafting stage is a bit more insulated from that risk. Well, uh, given that Parliament is the one asking scientists for their uh, help and their assistance, I think we also owe it to scientists to do justice to the work that they provide. And I think Lisbeth already argued uh, very well what the scientist's role is. And it's clear that we should not use scientists' advice for what it isn't. Uh, and it, it can never substitute political judgment, uh, but it can inform it. And if you weaponizing, of course, is a, uh, a bit of a pejorative term, but using it for your own political position, I think, yes, that is what scientists, uh, politicians will do. Um, but it's clear that that is never uh, what scientists can do uh, in, the, in the table format or in the pilot. And I hope, I hope also if we want to make this a more sustainable process that we realize ourselves that we abuse the scientists' advice to our own disadvantage in the long term because they will shy away from doing it the next time. And we will be the worst for it. Uh, because this also has to do with personal motivation of scientists. Eh? So I think uh, many, many scientists want want their science to be better used in ev- in policy making but that means if you want your evidence to be used in policy making that means it actually going to be used in policy making huh. and yeah and and that also means that uh, some people may uh, abuse it that's indeed a risk you have to consider yeah what's important is that what you write down as a scientist is really your independent uh, view on the topic and that's it and if another person wants to abuse that then that's that's really that person's choice i i think i'm as a scientist i'm not really writing down my personal view i'm i'm writing down the state of the evidence on a certain topic it's up to the politicians to work with that and it could go both ways you know there's some evidence that supports the bill that i was i was asked to advise on and there's also some evidence that, that doubts whether this instrument is really effective. So 
I'm not giving my personal opinion, and I don't think this scheme asks ask me to give my personal opinion. Um, and and in the in the situations at hand, I think we don't we didn't have this weaponization of um, of scientific evidence as ammunition in in, in in political fights. I I don't think it has happened yet. It could happen, I think. So. Yeah. Yeah, now, and we talked about crossing the bridge eh? and crossing the bridge from two sides. So we talked about the the, the scientist uh, side in terms of communication and being uh, being actionable, etc., but also still remaining independent. But from the politician side, there's also a bridge to cross. So I think the the, the political committees they need to organize that once these advices are there that actually the politician listen to the advices and invite the scientists to present. Uh, but also it, it might be necessary for the politicians to sort of get, sort of, let's say, a quick course uh, on how to read these documents. Uh, there's it, We have elections upcoming March 21. Uh, there's always an, um, a process in the first week for new parliamentarians when they come in they uh, they get their telephone and uh, the map of the buildings, but also they get some courses on the on the law, and and you, we might want to give a course on this process and on Article three point one and on how it how it works. So we get all the new one hundred and fifty chosen uh, elected parliamentarians, of which I very much hope that Joost will be one of them. Then then they get that course, and so we, we help them crossing that bridge. And we need to understand each other from from two sides. Yeah, the intention is to organize something uh, along the lines of the Evidence Week uh, that the House of oh, Commons yeah. has organized previously, <clears throat> and do this in the months after the upcoming elections, because there will be uh, coalition um, negotiations uh, and also a lot of new MPs. Um, so yes, I, I think this would fit uh, right in there. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. Now, obviously, the the purpose of this scheme, or at least one main purpose, is to get more evidence into political debate. And and with it being only a pilot, maybe it's a bit early to see if that effect has been realised systematically. But you've also mentioned quite a few positive side effects. For instance, like the hope that evidence might start to be taken into account further upstream in the process so it doesn't then run into trouble in Parliament later on, which is interesting. Or, or you asked you were talking about changing the way coalition agreements are written. Changing the way coalition agreements are being written, that's uh, daring to dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well, it was your dream, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I stand by it. Yeah, yeah so maybe Joost can, can elaborate on that. But let me, uh, there are two other advances which, which we try to uh, capture. Uh, one is that in the Netherlands, we're more and more speaking about uh, the, a, a broader welfare principle, uh, aiming policy not only at uh, economic growth and economic output, but also to broader welfare factors uh, like the environment, uh, like the impact on next generations, uh, like the impact on society, um, uh, like the impact on, on, on other countries. So. A broader welfare principle. This is um, now being monitored on the at the macro level. Uh, so for the country as a whole. Uh, so the the CBS, the, the Statistical Bureau, has developed an, an, a data infrastructure for that, and this is being monitored. It's being reported to Parliament uh, once a year and it's being debated. Uh, and what we what we have tried to do, and I think uh, we've proven it's it's possible, is to link the individual proposals, the individual laws, to the broader welfare principles. So you can ask yourself, how is this law related to the overall macro goals that we have in terms of broader welfare? Uh, So that's one step forward that we've taken. And the other one is that uh, I mentioned we also do a recommendation on on the method of evaluation and of course, scientists are yeah quite an expert when it when it is when it goes about let's say multi-year evaluations, yeah, longer-term projects. How do you evaluate those? And so, what we do intend with this process is that it makes the political process and Parliament vis-à-vis the responsible minister getting them more into a learning mindset rather than a very short-term accountability, I slash your head off if you don't make it mindset. 
And when we're talking about crossing the bridge, this, this is a big step for Parliament to, to take and to get into another mindset. So, so assume evaluation, you have, a, you have a certain midterm evaluations. Usually in normal life, when you have an evaluation, you, you learn from it also to see where can we get better. And we try that to be the mindset of the evaluation rather than this is the end of your political life mindset. Right, yeah. I think here we can learn uh, a lot from science and the philosophy of science and more uh, uh, introducing Popperian thinking into uh, Dutch politics, so to speak. I think they, uh, they call it permanent beta nowadays, but always looking forward and looking for falsification of your own uh, hypotheses and uh, political values or political proposals. And uh, Peter is absolutely right that this demands from us a different uh, mindset. Um, but I think it also helps uh, that this pilot uh, and this approach forces us to engage with scientists and their way of thinking. And for example, the different ways uncertainty plays into the political domain and plays into the scientific domain um, can definitely help. And in the end, of course, it all being taxpayers' money that we spend uh, or decide about uh, over, it also increases the bang you get for the buck. That's in the end, of course, one of the uh, other things why the, the financial committee, at least, uh, is interested in this uh, and generally uh, raising uh, the quality of decision making um, and the policy instruments that we uh, decide to employ. Yeah, if I, if I may add, I think it can change the process of lawmaking. Um, I think, um, you know, in the legal world, um, one always tends to think about um, how it should be. And this opens another way of thinking about how things really are. What is the problem? How can, I, how, how can we solve it, given that we want to solve this problem? And um, so it's an, it's an additional lens um, which may help with this you know, change in, in, in um, uh, the mindset. Peter's, uh, yeah, the mindset or the, or the culture. Um, so I think, it, I think it's very um, helpful in making laws more effective um, and you know, a adding uh, a another way of thinking to, um, to the lawmaking process. Some more enlightenment ideals uh, in the political domain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's usually it's usually it's me trying to drag philosophy of science into every episode. I think that's the first time a guest has referred to Popperian thinking. You can come back anytime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So, so that is really a very good finale to the conversation, which is a shame because I wanted to ask one more question. But let's treat this as a postscript. Is there something special about the Netherlands? do you think that means you can do this? Do you think this model could be exported and work in other parliaments? No, I think it can definitely work uh, in every parliament, um, but it does require a certain constituency of MPs that is willing to carry it and to be ambassadors for it and to push it a little bit further. And I think in this case, it also definitely helps that Peter was here before uh, and knows from the inside how parliament works and could also personally bridge the gap between uh, science and uh, politics in that sense. It's, so you need some parliamentarians uh, who have the intrinsic motivation to do this uh, because you, don't do, you do not immediately get into the newspaper, uh, but you need to have really this intrinsic motivation for yeah, using more evidence in the political work. Uh, also, what I encountered in my time, and, and Joost will, uh, probably has the same now, is that many parliamentarians, they, they, they come to you and they say, what you do is very important, but it's the second step is whether they really want to stand for it and whether they want to advocate it and want to put work in it. Because if you want to do this, yeah, you have to put work in it and, and not every activity that you do will get into the newspaper, but it will add to the quality of the of the political process of lawmaking of controlling the government but it has to be a motivation from within the politicians and from within the parliament and of course my hope is that once you get the stone rolling it will continue rolling and that's also always easier than getting uh, the stone to uh, move in the first place yes indeed well thank you all three stone rollers for this 
fascinating uh, deep dive into science and policy in the Dutch Parliament. I think it's clear the country is lucky to have parliamentarians and other interested parties who are willing to team up to give that stone a big shove in the right direction in the first place. I described the scheme at the start as radical, and I haven't changed my mind about that. We will watch it with interest. Thanks to all of you very much indeed for having this conversation. Thank you very much, Toby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learned societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elisaveta Sushchenko, so I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.